Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're finishing up the Gospel of Mark with the 16th chapter, Jesus' bodily resurrection and ascension. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Our prayer before Bible reading. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read them, mark them, and inwardly digest them, that by, <coughs> by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Why be afraid? It's, just, it's news, it's wonderful news that not only is the human soul immortal, but... Uh, hum a human being can be resurrected. But it's not just that. It's being afraid of what, what people will do when they hear you proclaim that Jesus, whom they crucified, was risen from the dead. Or Jesus, whose message they rejected, is risen from the dead. And also, since he's not appearing to everybody, he's just appearing to selected few. I think if I were that, I would have appeared first of all, to, I would have appeared to my mother first. But <clears throat> after that, I would have appeared to all those who wanted, who rejected my claims, <coughs> rejected my claims and, and wanted and plotted to kill me and succeeded in doing that in a nasty way. But not to incriminate them, but to call them to conversion and, and uh, to accept forgiveness. But that wasn't his plan. That's not usually the way God acts. He acts, asks us to respond in faith. Yeah, he gives evidences, but he asks us to respond in faith. So, so the they don't go to the tomb on the Sabbath because that contact with the dead is vital. And of course, there has to be the rolling away of the stone. Uh, from the tomb, the, all this other stuff. And uh, so it's work. So, uh, and it was the, f the first day of Passover as well. So, um, so they come on the Sunday morning. And here they name Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome. We brought that, so that's... And let's see if that's genitive or not. Where is my Greek New Testament? Now oh, I can't find it. Oh, well. Uh, because if it's genitive, it could be Mary, the mother of uh, uh, James and Salome, or it could be Mary, the mother of James, and then another person there, um, in addition to Mary Magdalene, Salome. But... Uh, I don't know where I put it. That's the big question of my life now that I'm into geezerhood. 
The Sabbath was passed. It was after 6 p.m. on Holy Saturday. <coughs> that was the the ending of the Sabbath, but it was, which was the beginning of the next day, Sunday, but the, the early in the morning, they do, it was very early on the first day of the week. So it's, uh, this is the Sunday. And so they brought spices, that would be things to anoint the body with <coughs> because of the... Uh, expected corruption, but bodies, Jesus' body had no corruption, as the book of Acts tells us. The first day of the week, Sunday morning, Christians commemorate the week, this weekly as the Lord's Day. See Revelation 1.10. So we're, we're not Jewish. We don't have the Shabbat. If you want the Shabbat, that's fine. If you have that in addition to the first day of the week, the resurrection as Christians, the Gentile Christians in particular. So it is a day set apart for worship rest in the celebration of the Eucharist as an assembled church. See Acts 27, the Catechism of the Catholic Church 2174-77. So they go to this tomb and the sun had uh, risen. This is uh, like Mary goes to the tomb just before the sun rises. And they were saying to one another, who will write away the stone for us? Because it's heavy. It's like a giant millstone. And it's in this indentation, this little indentation, which would keep it secure. So they'd really have to get somebody. In. The guards probably wouldn't be very cooperative. And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back, for it was very large. It's hard to miss. And entering the tomb... They saw a young man seated on the right side. This is an angel. Uh, dressed in a white robe, often what angels wear. The people in heaven in the book of Revelation wear white. That's the symbol of cle cleansing, being cleansed, uh, of purity, uh, because everyone in heaven is pure of all sins, forgiven and renouncing all sin. And... Uh, uh, of course, if you don't renounce graves, known, willed, grave sin, then heaven is not your destination. But uh, if you have uh, minor sins, you still have to renounce them if heaven is, uh, if you want to experience heaven. But heaven will be your final destination. But you will have ex experience a purgation beyond death. We should be, this should be our purgatory. This should be our situation here on earth of, 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 of purging, of being purified. Purified by what? By our own efforts? No, by the blood of Christ, with which we cooperate in the power of grace, which is grace that saves. So, so they, he was dressed in a white robe, and it, which is, uh, in uh, the book of Revelation, they said everybody in heaven wears white is the symbol of that. And that's why the baptismal robe is white. That's why the alb in the Latin rite of the priest, the, uh, the undergarment is white or the overgarment if it's, uh, if, if he's not going to be, be wearing a chasuble. Uh, if he's not celebrating mass, because the priest should always have a chasuble and a stole as well as an alb celebrating mass. So anyway, and he speaks to them. He said, do not be amazed, which is to say, not, do not be frightened by this. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, so just, just, this regular bloke, but who is actually God incarnate, who was crucified. They saw some of these, Mary Magdalene was there at, at the cross. So uh, <coughs> say they know that. And uh, he was going to say, he has risen. So not only raised, he's risen because he's got a character, of course, but uh, in his humanity, of course, it's humanity that <coughs> suffers. It's human, his human body that dies. His human soul doesn't die. And certainly his divinity is not, doesn't die, doesn't uh, change, doesn't suffer. He is not here. So we have to say, yes, he's not stuck in death. And neither will we be in the day of the resurrection. See the place where they laid him, the place, the sarcophagus, where he was in. 
that he was in the uh, uh, burial stone, which a big uh, bed-like stone or, or trough-like stone uh, hollowed out and the body would be placed in that. Or sometimes they were assembled, you know, the assembled stone uh, sides to it. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. Peter set out as the Princeps Apostolorum, the chief of the apostles, who would be uh, the vicar of Christ, not the successor of Christ. Christ doesn't have a successor. The vicar in the universal pastor there, for and the leader of the apostles, as we see him acting in the book of Acts. So, so he's put in a special category there, special naming. That he is going before you to Galilee, which is where they're from. And there you will see him as he told you, but before that they will also see him on the day of his resurrection. The uh, <coughs> apostles, that is. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And, and so, you know, how often Jesus is in the Gospel of Mark here is getting the messianic saying, don't tell anybody. Uh, but here he says, tell, tell them. And they're afraid they don't want it. They don't say it. So they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And we can be like that, too. We can be uh, intimidated by social pressures or very other pressures not to share the gospel, not to proclaim Jesus Christ is, is God incarnate. Who's, who died and rose from the dead, and uh, his teachings and his promises, uh, but we shouldn't be. We should, of course, we should uh, say it as, uh, explain our faith as, as fully as possible and as calmly as possible, but as intensely as possible, and... Um, and uh, look for opportunities that are, would not be counterproductive uh, in uh, in our speaking. A young man, Matthew calls him an angel of the Lord in Matthew 28 too. He has risen. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest miracle of history. Maybe second to the incarnation. The New Testament describes it as a glorious accomplishment of the Trinity. The Father, in Romans 6, 4, the Son, John 10, 17 through 18, and the Holy Spirit, Romans 1, 4, were together active. Of course, they're always together active. Uh, they don't do anything separately. There's nothing separate about the Trinity. Distinct first in persons, yeah, but no separation. Consubstantial and undivided. And one in purpose one in being. And together active in bringing about Christ's resurrection, glorification and heavenly ascension. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 648-50. Peter, Simon is singled out as the leader of the apostolic band and the head of the new covenant church. Matthew 16, 17 through 19, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 642. The summons to meet Jesus indicates that Peter's cowardice has been forgiven. Luke 22, 31 through 32. In John's gospel, Peter three times affirms his love for Jesus as personal restitution for his threefold denial. John 21, 15 to 17. And we'll get back to this. And I was going to look up so the women at the cross. Women at the cross. This doesn't have John in it. It's a. Let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
Matthew 27, 55. They were looking on many women from afar. Who had been, among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So those are the three Marys uh, named, although the mother of the sons of Zebedee doesn't get a name in this. And in uh, Ma Mark, there was a woman of Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. Again, Salome. who ministered to him. And then in Luke, Luke, maybe Luke doesn't. Well, let's go right on to the women who see the resurrection. So in, because there's Mary Magdalene in John, but uh, so here it's Mary Magdalene in, Ma in, in Mark, it's Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. So Salome is there, I would say. And in this, it's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, doesn't say which Mary it is, went to the sepulcher. Mm hmm mm hmm and it, 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 the, the women, uh, they found the tomb rolled away. In, in Luke, it doesn't say. I don't think it says, but anyway. So, that's, those are the women who are seen. And notice the women, women who were uh, put down in Mediterranean cultures in many ways, they're the ones who are the first to have the news of the resurrection. So let's see what Richard uh, Jared Slo Jared, Jared Sloyan has to say in the uh, Collegeville, the New Testament Reading Guide, Liturgical Press, Collegeville, Minnesota, 1960. This is page 120. There was, was freedom of movement after sundown on the Sabbath. Uh, you were restricted how far you could go on the Sabbath. Despite the full moon, the three women seemed to have attempted nothing that night, because they could have. It was after the, you know, the, the Sabbath was over and the first day of, of, of Passover was over. More spices could have been added, surely, but one wonders what their ground for hope of entry into the tomb was. Perhaps the longing to visit the site was their chief motivation. The aromata, that's the spices, the uh, uh, fragrant things, would have been brought out of love, but without any reasonable basis for hope that they might use them. They arrive after sunrise on Sunday. Details differ in the other Gospels, somewhat, and discuss their difficulty ineffectually. The mouths of tombs were well sealed against the depredations of grave robbers by slabs the size of millstones and often circular at that. Hasty inspection in the midst of their dilemma discloses that the problem has been solved. A youth is seated in the antechamber, as often the tombs would have a little antechamber and then there would be the chamber in which the sarcophagus or the locally, uh, the, the uh, Carvings contain bodies in the uh, the lozenge shaped carvings and, and would uh, in the walls or even uh, ledges uh, carved on benches sort of things um, and that would be in the second room if they had that there were one room ones too
an antechamber that had been carved in the soft sandstone. His appearance surprises him and causes awe. C914 for the same verb, but being awestruck, which Mark alone of the New Testament writers uses. He counsels against the terror just described, leads us to believe that all four accounts are calculated to instruct concerning the event rather than give precise transcriptions of what took place. We shouldn't expect that really in the Bible. That's, that's not the main purpose of the Bible. It's to communicate truth, not uh, give a travelogue, so to speak. But uh, They are told to bring word to Peter and the disciples of impending union with the master in Galilee according to his prophecy in 1428. Peter's denial requires this explicit promulgation. Besides, he is never mentioned in any order but first throughout the New Testament. The women flee in great fear to the point of speechlessness. The gospel breaks out here without indication that they retain the power to report what they had seen. That's the, <coughs> perhaps the original ending there. And the gospel well, let's look next let's look at the co the catholic commentary on sacred scripture the gospel of mark dr mary healy <clears throat> 2008 i believe yes 2008 published by baker academic a subset of baker publishing Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a very good series it is. And this is page 328. When Rock resumes his story, a full day has passed since the burial. He says nothing of Jesus or of the activities of the disciples during this time, leaving the mystery of Holy Saturday, that's the day between Good Friday and uh, uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, shrouded in silence. On Saturday evening, when the Sabbath is over, the three women who had witnessed the death and burial are able to buy spices <coughs> or perfect oils. They may have already had them, but chances are they didn't because this wasn't something they were expecting, the, the death of Jesus. Or perfumed oils, aromata, Excuse me. <laughs> needed to anoint the body properly. The devotion to Jesus moves them to perform one <coughs> last act of kindness for him, heedless of any concerns about the onset of decomposition. The faithfulness of the women and associated with the crucified Jesus contrasts with the faithful, faithlessness of Peter and the Twelve. Of course, John was there. 1450 through 66, 72 who are conspicuous for their absence. In the earliest possible opportunity, at dawn on Sunday, the women come to the tomb. Uh, but we noted they could have come at night. It was a full moon, after all. Um, Marx mentioned that the sun had risen as the first hint that the darkness accompanying the death of Jesus, 1533, the apparent triumph of evil, has been definitively overcome. Mark may be alluding to a prophecy at the very end of the Old Testament, quote, For you who fear my name, there will arise the sun of justice with its healing rays, Malachi 3.20. It is the first day of the week, the day when God created light. Interesting. Genesis 1, 3 through 5, the beginning of the new creation. It was the eighth day, the first day, but the eighth day, the first day of, of the new creation. But the women are still thinking on an earthly plane. As far as they know, Jesus' life and mission have come to a tragic end, and there's nothing left to do but show their respect for his remains. Jesus' prophecy of his resurrection, Mark 8, 31, 9, 9, 9, 31, and 10, 34, had completely eluded their grasp, just as it had for the male disciples. Their main preoccupation at the moment is a heavy stone. The women's inability to roll the stone back is symbolic of the utterly utter powerlessness of human resources against death, the most inescapable fact of human existence. St. Peter 
Chrysologus writes about rolling away the stone. This is on page 329. It is from the door of the sepulcher or of your own heart to, for the tomb or from your own eyes. You whose heart is shut, whose eyes are closed, are unable to discover the glory of the open grave. Pour then all your out your oil if you wish to see that glory, not in the body of the Lord, but in the eyes of your hearts. By the light of faith, you will then see that which through the deficiency of faith now lies hidden in darkness. Sermon 82. <coughs> but looking up a biblical image for recognizing God's action, <coughs> the women see that the seemingly impossible has already yet been done. The stone is rolled back. God has entered the story and has opened the grave. See Ezekiel 37, 12 to 13. I think that's the, the, the can these bones come back to life? Uh, yes. Yet, not yet enlightened, the women enter the tomb only to find a young man, clearly an angel. See Second Maccabees 3.26. Tobit 5.4.5. 5, Acts 1.10. And 1030 for similar portrayals of angels as young men. Clothed in a white robe. This recalls the young man who had fled naked from Jesus' arrest. I, I wouldn't recall that because it's the opposite. He, uh, he's not clothed in anything at the boom. He gets, gets his, uh, his bed sheet or whatever it was pulled off. See Mark 14, 51, 52, symbolizing the shame of the disciples who had abandoned Jesus in his hour of trial. The young man's heavenly attire here. See 9, 3 in Revelation 6, 11, and Mark 7, 9 is a hint. Oh, Revelation 7, 9, I should say. It is a hint that God has intervened to reverse the disciples' failure <coughs> and restore their dignity. See Mark 5, 15. At the sight of the angel, the women are completely amazed, filled with the wondrous awe that often accompanies biblical theophanies. The angel reassures the women and gives the Easter proclamation that is at the heart of the church's preaching. Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, has been raised. This message stresses the reality of Jesus' passion. It is the same Jesus who truly suffered and died on the cross, not some phantom not some, uh, not, you know, a, a ghost. This message stresses the reality of Jesus' passion. It's the same Jesus who truly suffered and died on the cross, who now is truly risen from the dead. He is not here. That is, he is not to be found in the tomb, the place of the dead. The passive verb has been raised means that it is God who raised him. Jesus, well, Jesus is God, but... That's another story here. This message stresses the reality of Jesus' passion. The verb, he is not here. He is not found in the tomb, the place of the dead. Jesus' agonized question on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, has received its answer. God has not forsaken his beloved son, but has vindicated him with a triumph far greater than any of his enemies could have imagined. An everlasting triumph over death itself. Jesus has not escaped death, but destroyed it from within, trampling on death by death. That's in the Easter Tropa. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tomb, sowing life. Pardon my voice, but anyway, I just had to sing it. His prophecy, this is page 330, comes true. He, the rejected stone, has become the cornerstone of the new and heavenly temple. The women are told to conform, that's page one, 333, as I said. The women are told to confirm with their own eyes the reality of the empty tomb. Because the empty tomb could mean, as most thought, his body was taken. 
but it could mean what it did mean. He is bodily resurrected. The sign that Jesus' body is no longer bound by death. In itself, the empty tomb is a proof of the resurrection, not a proof of the resurrection. See Matthew 28, 11 through 15. But a sign received in faith, confirming the testimony of the resurrection. See Acts 13, 30 to 35 in Romans 10, 9 and 1 Peter 1, 21. The women are then given a solemn commission. In Jewish law, women were ineligible to serve as witnesses because they were considered untrustworthy. See Midrash Rosh HaShanah, uh, 1, 8, and Josephus' his Antiquities, 4, 8, 15. Yet the faithful women are called to become the first witnesses of the resurrection, the apostles to the apostles. The summons to Galilee recalls Jesus' promise that after he was raised, he would go before the disciples to Galilee in Mark 14, 28, the place where the gospel was first proclaimed and from which it would now go forth to the whole world. It is a reassurance that the disciples, and Peter in particular, see Mark 14, 30, Luke 22, 31 to 33, and John 21, 15 to 17, have been for as have been forgiven for their failure and reinstated in their apostolic mission. In Galilee, the disciples themselves will see the risen Lord, because they see him before that in the upper room. But the, in Luke. But the reaction in, in, in John, John too. But the reaction of the women seems to thwart Jesus' promise, just as the disciples had earlier fled in fear from the cross. <coughs> Chapter 14, verse 50. The women flee in fear from the empty tomb and the Easter proclamation. They are seized with trembling and bewilderment. Suggest not just fright, but a holy awe at the overwhelming divine power manifested in the resurrection. It is the reaction displayed throughout the gospel to the disclosure of Jesus' divine dignity. See chapter 441, chapter 515. And uh, chapter 5, 33, chapter 6, 50, and chapter 9, 6 of the Gospel of Mark. Instead of carrying out the angel's commission, the women said nothing to anyone. The irony of the messianic secret in Mark's Gospel comes to a stunning reversal. Whereas Jesus had imposed silence on those he healed, an injunction that was sometimes ignored, now it is time for the mystery to be fully made known, yet the response is silence. The oldest and most reliable manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end here and record no appearances of the risen Jesus. The fact has occasioned much consternation. How could the Gospel end in such a disappointing and inconclusive way? Was the last place lost from the original manuscript, or did Mark perhaps die before he was able to complete his work? But when read in the light of his overall narrative purpose, the ending is not so surprising. Indeed, it is purposeful. Throughout his work, Mark has portrayed misunderstanding, fear, failure, and flight on the part of Jesus' chosen disciples. He, was depic he has depicted the shortcomings of even the leader of the early church, Peter, with relentless candor. He has brought the readers on a journey of discipleship as we too are confronted with Jesus' startling words, astonishing claims, awesome deeds, and divine logic that overturns all human ways of thinking. Like the original disciples, we have had to come to grips with the mystery of God's plan for a crucified Messiah. Now, with this last verse, Marcus finally brought his readers right into the center of the story. We too are now to face with the announcement of Jesus' victory over death. And how are we going to respond? Mark writes knowing that his readers are well aware of how the story unfolds. Now, every reader is ex invited to accept in faith the testimony to the resurrection. The story is not concluded. It continues in the life of every disciple of Jesus for all time. And of course, the gospel does continue, uh, which I was planning on doing today, but I'm not going to have time for that. So what will we look at next? How about the Nabare Bible? The Navarre Bible, published by Four Courts Press, Dublin, and 
Scepter Publishers, New York. That's Dublin, Ireland. The New York, New York, USA. In, oh, and I just saw that the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible is out, the, the Old Testament now from Ignatius. And that was, this was published, this is the Navarre Bible, Navarre Bible. Commentary of the New Testament, first edition, 2008, and this is the 2013 reprint. The Empty Tomb on page 227. From the very start of their preaching, the apostles make the point that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that is, fulfilling the scriptures. And what are the scriptures? The Old Testament. Uh, because they don't have a, nothing yet, the book of Acts, you know, when they proclaim this in Acts 2. 1 Corinthians 15.3. St. Mark has shown that Christ truly died, and now he reports that he truly rose from the dead. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. Verse 6. The young man says, this was the same name that was written on the placard posted at the top of the cross. And now it is used to proclaim the glorious triumph of Jesus' resurrection. St. Mark, by giving this information, leaves no room for doubt about the fact that the crucified and risen are one and the same person. The glorious resurrection of Jesus is the central mystery of our faith. If Jesus has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith too is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And the foundation of our hope, see 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. The resurrection means that Jesus has triumphed over death, sin, pain, and the power of the devil. True, as St. Augustine says, quote, <clears throat> the Christian faith faces no greater opposition than in the question of the resurrection of the body. Erationis in Salmos, 88, 2, 5. However, that same faith confesses that Christ is raised with his own body. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, Luke 24, 39. But he did not return to an earthly life. So in him, all of them will rise again with their own bodies, which they now bear. But Christ will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body, Philippians 3, 21 into a spiritual body, or better yet, a spiritized body, spirit-filled body, spirit-transformed body. See, the Lateran Council 4, Philippians 3.21 and 1 Corinthians 15.44, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church 9.99. The announcement made by the young man at the tomb also contains instructions which sum up the life of the nation church. The disciples, in particular Peter, are to be witnesses of the resurrection and all that it means. Their mission will start in Galilee. When Christ lived on earth, it actually starts in Jerusalem. But anyway, but they do, you know, they see the resurrected Christ in Galilee <coughs> before the Pentecost. When Christ lived on earth, that region was a place where Jews and Gentiles lived together. Now it becomes a symbol of the church's mission to the world at large. The church spread throughout the whole world, carefully guards the faith and preaching it has received as, as though living in one and the same house and its faith is the same in every place as if the church had one soul and one heart and whatever it preaches, teaches and transmits, it does so in unison as if from one mouth, St. Irenaeus and against the heresies, Adversus Eriseis, one ten two. From the earliest times of the church, this first day of the Sabbath was called the Lord's Day, because after the sorrow of the Sabbath, a joyful day breaks out, <coughs> the day of greatest joy, lit up by the greatest light for all, for this day saw the triumph of the risen Christ, St. Jerome and commentary on Mark. <coughs> Therefore, Christians saw the definitive time inaugurated by Christ as a new beginning, they made the first day after the Sabbath a festive day, for that was the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. The Paschal mystery of Christ is the full revelation of the mystery of the world's origin, the climax of the history of salvation and the anticipation of the eschatological fulfillment of the world. 
what God accomplished in creation and brought wrought about uh, wrought for his own people in the Exodus has found its fullest expression in Christ's death and resurrection. Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II, <coughs> on the Lord's Day, Dies Domini, 18. Given that Sunday commemorates salvation, we can see why the church says, quote, the duty to keep Sunday holy, especially by sharing in the Eucharist and by relaxing in a spirit of Christian joy and fraternity is easily understood if we consider the many different aspects of this day. Uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, Dies Domini 7. So let's look at the Collegeville commentary. The other Collegeville commentary. Liturgical Press, Collegeville, Minnesota, 1988. Page... Nine thirty-four. The end is the beginning. Go now and tell that he is risen. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark sixteen eight. This is how the women respond to the wonderful news of Jesus' resurrection. This is also how Mark ends his gospel. <coughs> it is generally agreed that verses nine through twenty were added to Mark's gospel, and they're just as inspired as the as the uh, proto Markan. Later by those who would not believe that Mark would end it as he did. By ending it this way, Mark actually invites his readers to step in and take the place of the women at the empty tomb. The women fail to carry out the mission orders they received from God's messenger, the young man clothed in white robe, verse 5. Mark wants his disciples, men and women, to spread the good news that God has brought life from death by raising Jesus from the dead. Verses 6 to 7. He wants them to do so without fear, bewilderment, or trembling. <clears throat> as we, at the, like the three women at the tomb did in verse 8. Mark's readers might well ask how they could be any better as disciples than the women and men who were with Jesus during his life, at his death, and at the empty tomb. Mark would probably answer this way. It is for you that this gospel has been written. Persevere as faithful followers of Jesus the Jesus I have presented to you. His resurrection is not the end. He has gone ahead of you as the servant Messiah. Now you must care for the needs of those most in need until he comes again. He has given meaning to suffering and has brought death from life, life from death. Trust in him and give, give his life to those who have no hope. Whatever you do, let others know by your courageous words and by your lives of service that you have heard the Lord's call, and that you have chosen to follow his lead until you see him as he promised. And let's look at, no, let's not do that because it's three o'clock now. And let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's push the finish.